so um, good afternoon. Thanks for allowing me to uh, present uh, what I think is a really exciting uh, question and problem for, for, well, for many of our scientists to solve. We have one in the back who's working on this, Dr. Sunwoo, who's, who's in my department and in our division. Um, but especially for the members of the human biology class, um, this, we have no answers, we have no associations, and only questions, and so I hope to tell you a little bit of a story and to engage you in this, um, I think, very fascinating clinical question about thyroid cancer. Uh, I thank uh, Marsha for the opportunity to be here, but also uh, for the question, uh, what's the, what do we know about this? And uh, unfortunately, I have nothing new to report, but um, it's, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, so, uh, greetings from the, I'm an ENT surgeon, that's that crazy word, otolaryngology, uh, and this is our division here. Uh, we are specialists in the area of the throat, but also the neck, and so thyroid surgery is very near and dear to uh, many of us uh, because of its rich anatomic complexity uh, and the significant impact we can play in terms of cure for our patients that's very dramatic. Um, so I'm going to talk about a so-called epidemic of thyroid cancer. Um, and talk about clear differences that are seen between men and women in the incidence of disease. Talk to you a little bit about what that really is. It's actually an epidemic of micro papillary thyroid carcinoma. And then talk about what we're going to do about that. And then conclude with the very, a very brief review of the paucity of literature out there about why this is the case. Why are so many women getting this disease? Um, uh, and, and hopefully engage you. So um, if you've read the San Francisco Chronicle uh, in the last year or, God forbid, um, watched the Fox Business News report, um, you, I, I came from MD Anderson in Texas, so that, that, you know, that joke played better down there. But um, uh, OK, good. All right. Yeah, it may play better up here, actually. Um, but it was like, more ironic down there. Um, you've heard about this. And, and the thyroid, um, I mean, what is the thyroid? I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit to the class here. I mean, the thyroid gland is the master hormone. And I've got Dr. Wu, uh, Wu here who's going to keep, she's an endocrinologist, so she really knows about this disease. I just operate on it. Um, but uh, this is the master control gland that sits in the lower part of the neck. It's a really interesting history. I have to tell you briefly, the ancient Greeks called it thyroidius because that means shield, and they thought it was the shield of the trachea, which was the connection to the heart with, where the soul was. Of course, it has nothing to do with any of that, but it's a cool story. Um, it's very close to the thyroid cartilage, which also looks like a shield. Um, but um, it's, it's, uh, it sits low in the neck, and it plays a really critical role in, in, in setting the metabolic rate um, the, for every cell in the body. And without the thyroid gland and thyroid hormone, uh, we, we would not live. Um, it's a fascinating disease. It's one of those diseases that everyone says, oh, well, gosh, it's, if you have to have a cancer, it's a great cancer to have. I never say that. Please, uh, hopefully some, some of you will be uh, inspired by your time here today and, and other encounters to go into to medicine and surgery, um, but please don't say that. Um, uh, and there's actually a lot of literature about that. But this is an amazing problem because all the, when I was an undergraduate at a medical school, there were like 25,000 cases a year. I remember that number when I was cramming for something. I still remembered it. There are 63,000 cases this year now, uh, and that's over... Uh, 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 hopefully uh, a quarter or a half of a professional lifetime. And it's a, it's, it has this amazing survival rate, literally 98%. And so if you go to the SEER database right now today and look, the survival rate is, is 98%. But yet look at this, from 1992 to now, I mean, there's this, been this massive um, increase in this disease. And I'm going to um, <clears throat> show you some numbers um, to put to the, that curve. So first of all, this is a talk about differences between men and women and, and the impact of, of sex and gender on cancer. And so, of course, I have to show this slide. This is from um, uh, Dr. Nguyen and I and perhaps others have cited this classic cancer statistics paper. It comes out every January from the American Cancer Society. And this is what we all put in the beginning of our talks to show how important our, our, our disease is. Um, <laughs> and in head and neck, we never, we never showed up on this graph. But but here, it's sad because all of a sudden, thyroid is a top five cancer in women. Um, you see here listed, it, it doesn't show up at all in men. Unfortunately, oral cavity and pharynx now shows up because it's related to HPV, which is why I asked Dr. Nguyen that question. But look at that, it's a top five cancer. And literally, just two decades ago, it was sort of a, a, a curiosity, a surgical curiosity. 
So it's really important because you, you've heard you know, in the press that we're doing much better in treating cancer, except if you're under the age of 50 and you're a woman, in which case we're not. And there's actually an increase in, the ra in cancer rates in that population, women under the age of 50. And um, it has a little bit to do with breast cancer, which is slightly on the rise, but has a lot to do with, um, with thyroid cancer, which you see here in this yellow line that's slowly creeping up. Fortunately, uh, oh well, I wish this number were down here, but, um, but fortunately this does still account for a small number of, of, of women who do get cancer, but it actually drives the, the, the incidence of cancer in women up, as this table five from the cancer statistics paper shows. First of all, it shows this uh, striking disparity uh, between men and women uh, throughout the decades, but a clear rise in the incidence uh, of women. This is basically an annualized uh, percentage change uh, of, of thyroid cancer, um, so 4% increase, almost 7% increase. Um, basically, over the last decade, in, it's been increasing in men and women by 5% uh, each, each year. Um, and interestingly, it's one of the few cancers, aside from liver cancer, that actually are on the rise. The mortality associated with this disease is on the rise, which doesn't make sense with what I just showed you, uh, and Anne is shaking her head back there, but it doesn't make sense when you see 98% survival. Why is this one of the few diseases that is actually, um, uh, has, has its mortality rate increasing? I really, ha I can't explain that. But those media reports that came out last spring have everything to do with uh, a professor of otolaryngology in Vermont and her me internal medicine colleague, um, Dr. Welch, and they looked at the SEER database kind of before anybody was seriously looking at this um, back in 2006 and published something and recently they did a follow-up report. And this is the, kind of the, the deep dive into the real statistics behind what you saw on the SEER database. So here, this goes back all the way to 1975 and you saw the rate was around five cases per 100,000 uh, in the overall incidence. Uh, and then you just see this precipitous rise starting some, uh, some uh, where here in the, back, the last two decades. And now it's up to almost 15 patients per 100,000. I mean, that's just, you don't see that. Um, the good news is, although there's that bump up in mortality, that there's really no significant change. Patients who have this disease do well despite that, that slow incremental rise. So since 75, this has increased from five to almost 15 patients per 100,000. All of these cases of thyroid cancer are due to um, papillary thyroid cancer, and overwhelmingly, it used to be um, three times as many women, now it's four times as many women are getting this disease as men. And again, the conclusion of, 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 of my, my lecture, my take home message is that we don't know why. So if, you know, you can leave now if you want, I guess, but, um, <laughs> but I'm gonna try to, yeah, yes, that's, that's exactly what I, I hope this lecture will, since I have no answers, hopefully we can at least inspire a generation to investigate. So anyway, this breaks down, uh, in this uh, study that was just published last year, this breaks, breaks down thyroid cancer by histologic type and, and you know, far and away, here's all types here in the solid line, again, over that same time period, all, uh, all types um, rising, and then you, basically all of this is accounted for by papillary thyroid cancer. There's some very rare tumors, uh, anaplastic and medullary down here, and then the other type that's fairly common called follicular carcinoma. And then to answer uh, Marsha's question, the overwhelming majority of these patients that are getting this disease are women. Um, there's been a slow rise uh, in the rate of thyroid cancer in men, but overwhelmingly, um, this disease over the last uh, 30, 40 years is rising in women precipitously. Now, what do we do with this cancer? Well, I know about it. I know about this problem because I'm a head and neck surgeon, head and neck endocrine surgeon, and we treat these patients with surgery and radioactive iodine, and the very small positive patients that don't respond to that end up getting some other treatments that we won't talk about today. But I wanted to show you, this is actually in that paper, and it shows uh, a breakdown of treatment type uh, based on gender. So here's women and men, and you see um, the vast majority of the population is getting some kind of surgery with or without radioactive iodine, 131 isotope, uh, and here's the same uh, breakdown of men. I want to draw your attention to the very top part of that bar. Don't, you don't really need to know anything else. This is, the, this is the percentage of population with this disease that got no treatment. That's very odd that patients wouldn't be treated, but um, we're gonna talk about that next. Final point I make, wanna make from this study is the vast majority of the, and this is from their original 2006 report, the vast majority of the rise in this disease is due to tumors that are very small, less than two centimeters, less than an inch, and that's really interesting. Um, so look at the rates of this disease um, 
for very large tumors. Fortunately, this, this line is flat um, from two centimeters to five centimeters, kind of rising, but essentially flat. All the precipitous rise, again, has been uh, in tumors that are less than two centimeters. And this is, again, a JAMA publication. Really great work. So really, this is an epidemic of micropapillary cancer. And interestingly enough, this has a long history and um, goes back to 1988 and the WHO pathology consensus clarified that this is something that's less than a centimeter. You have to be an adult to be called that because if you're, if you're, if you're a child, the dimensions of your thyroid are smaller, et cetera. But we're dealing with an epidemic of micropapillary carcinoma, and it is a true epidemic. This is a paper from the Korean Journal of Oncology and Hematology and Medical Sciences. And you, you don't really need to see anything other than these huge spikes. These are uh, curves of incidence looking at men and women. Um, there are two time cohorts here, 2002 and 2008 uh, in the black, 2002 in the white. And you see oh, across all the countries of the world a relative rise in the incidence of thyroid cancer and in particularly one country, and that's Korea. And um, this is a really, really interesting story that was actually recently highlighted by um, the New England Journal. Um, this is a colleague of mine who was at, uh, was a postdoc in MD Anderson when I was in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery there. And um, uh, it's a really interesting story. And I'm taking too long because I'm putting in too many details here. But um, in preparation for this, uh, I, I actually read this article in detail and found out that Korea spends only 8% of their GDP on health care. Does anybody know in the room how much we spend on ours? It's, a, it's about 18%, exactly right. So this is very interesting. They're spending 8% uh, of their GDP, very technologically driven health care. They have the second highest number of beds in the entire world per capita. Um, and as a result, 40, so you know, 63,000 cases in a, in a country of 300 million. In Korea, there's been 40,000 cases. So in a population essentially a sixth the size, they have two-thirds the number of these thyroid cancer cases. So that's just, that's really interesting and, and kind of no one knows why. But there is a strong suspicion that has to do with the use of technology. No one's shown this definitively. In fact, there's a lot of controversy in literature, I'm not going to get into that, but basically this is a graph that shows all countries and access to internet as a proxy uh, for uh, technological uh, innovation and incorporation of technology into uh, all aspects of society, including medicine, and Korea literally is one of the highest in the, in, in the, in the world. And that basically suggests to many of us that the reason why there's this epidemic is that this population relies on technology, has access to ultrasounds, and um, is finding this disease at a much earlier stage. Remember, they're all small. The rise is small uh, based on those JAMA curves. Now, I'm from near Kentucky. I'm proud to, I, I don't mind admitting that. And, 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 and so in contrast to that last graph, this is a, a, this is a paper from, uh, uh, from thyroid that compared basically access to technology and incidence of thyroid cancer comparing Kentucky um, with New Jersey and uh, is that Connecticut? Yeah, it's Connecticut. Um, and so you can see here where there's very little technology in these, in these rural counties. Well, this is, by the way, rural. Um, you, you see a very low incidence of this disease. So really fascinating. So what are we going to do? Um, these are a proliferation of small tumors. Uh, wow, this is a new phenomenon. Actually not. Uh, there is nothing new under the sun, and there is a pathologist who published in 1947 reviewing all autopsies in Boston that there's a 10% rate of, of thyroid cancer in all autopsies being done in, this, in the city hospital of Boston. Really, really interesting. And if you go back, and I don't have time to go into this really interesting story, uh, doctors uh, Fukunaga and Yatani pooled almost 1,200 thyroid glands from around the world and looked at the same issue on a much broader scale, and this was published in the 70s in cancer, and they found these huge variations across the world, which, again, we don't have time to get into today. The prevalence of thyroid cancer incidentally identified at the time of autopsy, not related to death, is shown here, and basically anywhere from 5.6 to 28 percent of patients who die unknowingly have actually thyroid cancer. So what is going on? I mean, is this a real disease or not? And what are we going to do about it? There's actually a group in Japan that don't do anything about it. And that seems irresponsible until you look at this disease. Again, they're very small. 
Here is the experience of, of um, Dr. Ito, who looked at growth of these cancers and growth defined as greater than three millimeters. At five years, only 6% of them grew. At um, 10 years, only 16% only grew. But some are even developing metastasis. Fortunately, those numbers are much smaller. So uh, I'm going to kind of skip over this um, in the, in the um, in interest of uh, time here. But the bottom line is that BRAF has been implicated as an, as an adverse biomarker to guide us to take out the bad tumors. And my colleague, Lisa Orloff, who just joined us from UC, showed that that's actually not the case. And that in her study, which had 430 patients, she did not see that BRAF was a driver of bad, um, of bad outcomes but all the smaller studies did. Um, and then to follow up on that, a, a big multi-center experience concluded in a JAMA publication that, that she was wrong and that they were right and that BRAF is actually is associated with poor outcomes. So maybe we can do a BRAF test on those small tumors and decide who to operate on. This is the study that showed this clear association between those patients who had um, the mutation did much worse compared to those who did not. But in fact, if you read the fine point, when you factor in the clinical variables, such as distant metastasis, invasion outside the thyroid, and, and um, distant spread, BRAF isn't a good biomarker. So we have no idea what we're doing and what, how to treat this <laughs> disease. And so this is a great problem um, for you to study. But um, I've made a classic mistake. I've, pent, I've spent too much time introducing the problem, uh, and I haven't told you enough about really what there is to know. But fortunately, there isn't much to know. Uh, <laughs> And a great study has come out of the San Francisco uh, Bay Area, a really rigorous epidemiological study with uh, cases and controls matched um, uh, by uh, women uh, on a variety of factors, uh, age, um, uh, ethnicity, et cetera. And they looked at every aspect of reproductive health, the onset of menses, menarche, uh, the onset of, uh, of menopause, number of children, no children, all these factors, nothing was significant. Uh, in this study. But what was interesting is that oral contraceptive use actually might have had a protective effect. If you look at ever oral contraceptive users, they actually had a reduced odds risk, odds ratio risk for developing papillary thyroid cancer. And that's really interesting because maybe like estrogen is providing a protective effect. Um, but then you read another study, which is granted an older study um, with 70 patients where they did a very sim simple study. They used immunohistochemistry targeting this D5 antibody to the estrogen receptor and found that, wow, 26% of the patients who have this disease overexpress the estrogen receptor. And that if you grow up, they were able to grow up and culture nine of those patients' tumors. Uh, and then you, um, you, you stimulated them with estradiol the, using this uh, uh, BRDU assay, basically it's a synthetic nucleoside that is incorporated into DNA when cells are proliferating. If you give those cells that overexpress estrogen receptor in papillary thyroid cancer estradiol, there's a slightly higher rate of proliferation. So who's right? Who's wrong? In the lab, we are, are thinking that, the, that, that estrogen should drive this, but um, you know, somehow estrogen has a protective effect um, on the large epidemiological study. Similar study here showing overexpression uh, of, of, of the uh, estrogen receptor. And I'm going to skip over this study, um, but suffice it to say that in pregnancy with significant hormonal changes, thyroid nodules grow uh, on average of about 10%. Um, and there's another study that has implicated tumors, malignant papillary thyroid tumors that develop in pregnancy as being higher rate of, of recurrence. Uh, that, that, that also really confounds everything and, and just suggests that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So with that, I'll conclude uh, just slightly late. Um, and hopefully I've uh, fascinated you by this disease, which deeply fascinates me. It's not really an epidemic. It's sort of a, an, uh, an epidemic of overdiagnosis, but it, it, it underscores how little we know. There are three Gs of variation, gender, geographic, and probably genetic. And there's some signal in sex hormones and, the, and how it affects um, the development of, of thyroid cancer, but a lot of noise, and that's for you to sort out. Thanks very much.